G'day and welcome to Bar C Model Reviews and today I've got something from Free Sky. No, they didn't send it to me. This is a bought one. It is a Free Sky long range system and I'm going to be looking at just a quick look on the beach today because as soon as I opened the box I noticed some things that I didn't really think were right but uh, that's the box. Isn't it beautiful? Let's get rid of that. Let's see what you get for your money and you don't get a hell of a lot. You get a receiver and you get a transmitter module. There you go. Oh, and you also get couple of pages of instructions there you go in the typical free sky, form, free sky format now before I go ahead with anything else I have to say I think most people realize I'm a free sky fan I was uh, from the first time I saw their 2.4 gig modules which they bought out many years ago and I reviewed them and found them to be simply superb I've been a fan of the stuff and it's been served me very reliably for many many years free sky uh, have acknowledged I uh, guess in some way the fact that uh, my reviews helped them uh, grow in the way they did so they were sending me stuff to look at and stuff to review and so forth that was great until they sent me a Horus and I didn't like it and now they don't send me anything <laughs> they don't even answer my emails as I've said in other videos uh, but I'm still a great fan of the product I'm still a great fan of Free Sky stuff they're, they're really good engineers they know what they're doing most of the time they come up with some cool products they've had as I say with the Horus it was really that it wasn't it was the wrong product for the market at the time and I think that's what I said and I believe I've been proven correct because the QX10 afterwards um, has been a rip snorting success because it's what the market wanted. They wanted a relatively low cost radio with lots of features, not an expensive, overpriced, you know, equivalent of the top range Futaba radio. They wanted something that was, you know, good value. And the QX7 is fantastic value. If you are looking for a radio and you don't want to spend a fortune, the QX7 is the radio to get. It's fantastic. Anyway, aside from that, that the, the Horus was the only ball they dropped as far as I could see. But now, We've got the long range system. How are they doing with this? And as I say, I want to be enthusiastic about this because I love Fresco. Even though they don't send me Christmas cards anymore, I still think they're a really good company. Love it, love the gear. Right. But when I opened the box, my first thoughts were, what the hell's going on here? Um, this is a 900 megahertz system, right? 900 megahertz. And the first thing I noticed was, what the hell's wrong with the aerials on this thing? To give you an idea, let me just show you a 433 megahertz UHF antenna. This is the antenna you get with a UHF system. There you go. Look how long that sucker is. That's that's like a foot long, that antenna. It's a foot long. Antennas, just to give you a bit of a background, are usually a multiple of a quarter wavelength. So this is, uh, you know, if we take, for example, the wavelength of 900 megahertz, if I use my supercomputer here, I can calculate that out. Let me see. Uh, try not to bang the thing. Here we go. Uh, 300 divided by 900. It is about 30, 33.2, or 332 millimetres. 332 millimetres is a full wavelength of 900 megahertz. Let's go, how long is that? 332. That is ta -da, about that long. See, oh, I can't even fit it enough to pull out a bit further because I can't even fit that in. There we go. That's a full wavelength. That's one whole wave at 900 megahertz. So most antennas we're going to use will be half a wavelength. The active elements will be half, sorry, quarter of a wavelength. So if we divide 332 by 4, we'll get about 80 something, probably 82 or something like that, 83 millimeters. So oh, let me get in here. That's, that's a quarter of a wavelength from there to there at 900 megahertz, right? So that should be, the aerial should be a multiple of this in some way. Now, let's look at the antenna we've got here. Well, we can't fit can't fit that in there. That wouldn't even fit. A quarter wavelength wouldn't fit in there. And also, we have to have a counterpoise. So generally speaking, we have two parts to an antenna. There is the active element, and then there is the counterpoise, as it's called. I can show you that very clearly on this. Here we go. See that? Now, this is a, another 900 megahertz system. And if I measure it, my goodness, look at that. The active element is exactly what I calculated, 83 millimeters. And you'll notice the active element because you see there's a fat part around here. This is the counterpoise. This is a sleeved dipole. So we've got an active part and a sleeve. The sleeve basically is there to balance the antenna, to make it so that um, it, it, it's uh, providing a balance. Well, it's not actually balanced. It's unbalanced in this case. But you've got an active part and the passive part down here, typically. So, oh, this is a crossfire. My goodness. Um, so that's what I'd expected to see in terms of antenna on the... Free sky system, and as you can say, uh, this is half the frequency, so it should be twice the wavelength. If we look at it, yes, this is about half the length of that. So, what the hell is going on here? So, as soon as I saw the module, I thought, are they using what we call a loaded dipole? Now, a loaded dipole is 
pretty straightforward. What you do is you take some of the antenna and you just coil it up. So it's not stretched out, it's all wound up in a coil. When you do that, you can make the antenna shorter for the same frequency. You can make the physical length shorter because you're just winding some of it up. The problem is there is a price to pay and that price is efficiency. So a, a loaded dipole is nowhere near as good as an unloaded, a regular dipole. So I thought, oh my goodness, they're going for long range. Why are they using such crappy antennas? And then it actually turns out I found out a little later uh, they shipped the wrong batch of antennas. These are supposedly 2.4 gig antennas. What? Why are they shipping a 2.4 gig antenna with a 900 megahertz module? That is so bad in so many ways. Firstly, it's not going to work very well. It's going to work like crap. It's not tuned to the right frequency. So you'll get very poor efficiency. And that means if you run this thing at one watt, then most of the power is going to actually go into the aerial, bounce back, and do nothing but heat up the expensive semiconductor parts inside your transmitter module. Ooh. So FreeSky, what an epic fail that was. Um, apparently they're sending out new antennas, and surprisingly, they're longer than that. Who'd have thought? Okay, but let's go now to the receiver. And there's the antennas for the receiver. And again, I'm thinking, hmm, let's compare it to the Crossfire antenna, which is a true uh, dipole. Look at that. Um, they're not as long. They're shorter. What the hell's going on there? And this time, yes, they are using a loaded dipole. If we look very closely at this, I'll use the macro lens, you'll see that the copper runs actually up to the end of the antenna, and then it kills back down. And it's what we call a, it's a loaded antenna. So they have effectively coiled up part of the antenna to make it physically smaller. But again, I'm left scratching my head. You want a long-range system. If you want a long-range system, why are you compromising in terms of antenna performance? Antenna performance is crucial to long-range. You can have the most sensitive receiver in the world, and if you plug it into a crap-ass antenna, it's going to perform poorly. And antennas are pretty cheap to make in terms of, you know, making a good antenna. They're not expensive. So what is FreeSky doing here? Um, if you look at the Crossfire receiver that I was, I was sent, um, it's got two of these loaded dipoles. Look, it's fantastic. That's going to give you maximum signal at the input to your receiver. This is going to give you crap. Um, now, there's another factor with these antennas too, which oh, leaves me, I don't know, what's happened? Have, has the engineer at FreeSky died and they put the tea lady in charge? I don't know, because let's take a close look at this. Right, so here is the antenna, the receiver antenna. I'm trying to get, it, I'm trying to get the light right so you can actually see what's going on here because there's some copper under this black stuff. There we go. I think you can see just there that we have a, a run of copper out here on the top edge and a run of copper down there along the bottom edge. So what we've really got is just, it's just a dipole. It's got wire coming out one side and wire coming out the other side. Unfortunately, there, there is a technical word. It's, a, it's not quite as important on a receiver aerial as a transmitter aerial, but what we have here is a mismatch. We've got a balanced antenna being fed by an unbalanced feed line. What does that mean? Well, think of it as a square peg in a round hole. This coaxial cable, the, the, the black cable you see there, that is what we call an unbalanced feed line. That is to say, when it's working properly, all the current flows in the inside wire. None of the current flows on the outside wire. But the antenna is a balanced dipole. That means that this side is the same as that side. So when it encounters a signal, you get a current induced in both sides of the antenna. So when you connect a balanced antenna to an unbalanced feed line, you get a mismatch because the antenna is trying to make current flow on the outside of this cable and it's not supposed to flow on the outside of an unbalanced feed line. So you're going to lose signal, you're going to have all sorts of issues with reflections, um, SWR, all sorts of crap like that. And so again, you're losing efficiency, you're just not getting the performance you should get. As I say, it doesn't matter quite so much on a receiver antenna because the power levels we're dealing with are quite low, so you're not going to get overheating of anything or damage to anything. but you got to remember, this is a telemetry system. So one of these antennas, or maybe both of them, will actually also be transmitting. And this brings up another issue. This can be running at one watt. The module can work it up to one watt. So it's going to put out a really strong signal with the right antenna. The receiver, when it's sending telemetry data back, is only going to be able to send a maximum of a tenth of a watt, because that's all the chips in here will do. So you're transmitting one watt, but your telemetry is coming back at one tenth the power. And so if you don't have a really good antenna on here, then you're going to get very poor transmission of your telemetry data. Your telemetry data will drop out long before your control signal. And you might think, ah, that's not that important. But on the FreeSky system, it is, and here's why. Here is the receiver, and you'll notice it's got um, quite a few plugs on it. It's got server connectors, and it's got SBUS in, SBUS out, and a smart port. Now, 
The problem is that if you're going to use a long range system, you want to know just how strong the signal is at the aircraft end, where, because eventually you're going to run out of range. And you don't want to run out of range unexpectedly. You want to be able to stop before you reach the point where suddenly you can no longer control the model. So most people use a system, or well, use the signal which is called the RSSI, it's the Received Signal Strength Indicator. It's like a volume gauge, it's like a VU meter for the radio frequency signal strength. And usually they connect that signal from the receiver to the OSD. So you can see on screen a number that tells you how strong the received signal is. And as that number drops lower and lower and lower, you're getting a weaker and weaker signal. Now, there is no RSSI output on this receiver, it doesn't have one, it's like Hmm, okay, so you can't connect anything to an OSD. Fresco guy obviously think that, well, you're going to have the RSSI figure going back to your transmitter, and you'll be able to have a warning on your transmitter, but, as I just pointed out, you're going to get much less range out of your telemetry than your control link. So, your telemetry, your ability to tell how strong the received signal is, will drop out long before you get to the limits of range. So, you're going to be flying blind, probably, you know, half to two-thirds, well, just after halfway or just after two thirds of the way to the ultimate range of the system. It's not very good. Now I understand there is a little um, pad on the receiver board you can solder to and with the right firmware you can get an RSSI signal out. But why isn't it just standard stock? They have RSSI on other receivers. The, the L9R has an RSSI output. And you can see that here on the L9R, RSSI, because this is a long range receiver too. So you can take the signal out of there and put it onto your OSD. There is no such signal on the R9. Why not? It should be so simple. You shouldn't have to go farting around soldering wires onto the board to make it work. This is, you know, it's Basics 101. As I say, the tea lady designed this thing. Um, yeah, what can I say? Now, as I said, this uh, module has multiple power levels. You can change the power output level. That's quite common for long range systems. It's pretty useful because uh, I know with most systems, if you're flying long, you start off on low power. I mean, you don't need full power when you're in the first part of a long range flight. So you run it on lower power, it means your transmitter battery lasts longer, the system runs cooler, you don't interfere with other users of the same band. It's pretty much common sense. It's a good idea. Then when you start getting further into your flight and you need, you see the RSSI number dropping down, you can flick to high power and it boosts the transmitter module output power and your RSSI level comes up and you can fly much further without losing control. Now the Free Sky has multiple power levels, but You've got to flick these little switches, dip switches on the back of the module. I mean, seriously? Um, that is crazy. Why can't there be a simple toggle switch that can be easily reached and adjusted? Who the hell wants to, partway through a flight, put their transmitter down, get a screwdriver and start flicking switches? No, 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 no. That's not a good idea at all, but that's the way the system works. I mean, as I say, the, the, the ergonomics, the human factor of design seems to be a bit missing in the system, which is a shame. I'm sure that when I rip these down in the next video, when I tear them apart, the engineering inside will be perfect, it'll be beautiful. It'll be wonderfully designed from a circuit board point of view. The, the quality control will be excellent in terms of the manufacturing. The solder joints will be glistening and shiny, but it's not much use if the design, the human functionality, the, the way you use it is, you know, poorly thought out. And it seems to be the case. Unfortunately, it seems to be the case. Now the next big problem is how the hell do you range test this thing? I mean, there is no country I know of in the Western world that allows you to legally fly a model aircraft beyond the visual line of sight. Um, in America, maybe, you, no you can't because once you've lost sight of it, it's no longer a model aircraft, therefore it, you're not protected by the, uh, the rules that say you, know, you can operate under the code of practice of a recognized group. It becomes an unmanned aerial vehicle and the FAA regulations apply and they say you can't fly beyond visual line of sight. So yeah, it's like, uh, we all know it happens. I mean, there are so many videos on YouTube of people flying tens of kilometers or tens of miles away from the launch point and no one's ever been killed. No one that I know of has been injured. I haven't heard of any incidents resulting in property damage or impacts with manned aircraft. So it can be done safely. People have been doing it safely for many, many years. Ever since um, FPV came out, people have been flying beyond visual line of sight. But legally, you cannot do it. And I'm in the invidious position that I obviously can't be seen to be doing it either. If I put up a video where I flew a model airplane out to 10, 20, 30 kilometers from the launch point, CAA would be knocking on my door, they'd string me from the tallest tree and they'd use me as an example of what not to do. And I don't want to be in that position. So I can't fly a model beyond visual line of sight. I certainly can't fly it far enough to test out the potential range of this or any other long range system. So it leaves me scratching my head, how do I test this thing in a legal fashion? And the first thought I came up with was to use one of these. Ta -da, what's that? Well, that's an attenuator. That's, it's a simple device. What it does is it, it, you have a certain amount of power goes in, and much less power comes out. 
And this is a 20 decibel attenuator, which means that one hundredth of the power you put in will come out. So if I put 100 milliwatts in here, only one milliwatt will come out there. And since this is a multi-power transmitter module, now, unfortunately, even on the lowest power, 10 milliwatts, you'd probably be able to fly well beyond visual line of sight at 900 megahertz. So I, even running it on the lowest power, I couldn't legally test it. But if I was to put this between the antenna and the module and reduce the 10 milliwatt power level by 100 to 100 microwatts, then sure, it would probably give me a range limit that was well within visual line of sight. Unfortunately, what happens is when you get down to microwatt power levels, attenuators don't work very well because Inside the board there, there are all sorts of components which generate this signal and quite often they will radiate more than 100 microwatts just from the circuit board itself, even without an antenna. Um, and which means that when I put this in here, the actual radiation from the circuit board and the components used will exceed the radiation from the antenna. So the range I get will not really be indicative of the 100 microwatt power level because there may be 200 microwatts coming straight out of the plastic case. It's not a metal case, it's plastic, so it's not going to stop the direct radiation from the components that make up the transmitter module. So <clears throat> that's not going to work. I have to scratch my head again. What else can I do? So my next thought was, hey, maybe we have to take a road trip. So what I plan to do is there's a hill just down the road from here. It's several hundred feet high. I'm going to sit someone on top of the hill with a transmitter, with this module, with the Crossfire module, with the Shira long range system with the easy UHF, with the Dragon Link, and with some other Chinese thing that I can't remember the name of. And I'm going to drive away with all the receivers in my truck. And I'm going to stop every now and then, stop at 5 kilometers, stop at 10 kilometers, 20, 30, and we're going to compare and see which are still working and which aren't. And that's about the only way to do it. So it gives a pretty close approximation to flying a model because in this case, the transmitter will be elevated by several hundred feet, just as the model would be if you were standing on the ground and flying long range. It'll give us, it's not going to be a totally representative figure, but it is going to give us, you know, a sort of a feel for what these systems will do. I'm not going to use this antenna, of course. I don't think FreeSky will be sending me out a replacement antenna. Um, I'm on the blacklist, so even if <laughs> I'm not going to get one, so I'm going to have to put um, a different antenna on there. I'll make up what I think is a reasonable um, antenna for 900 megahertz, put it on there, and we'll use that as a reference point. These antennas, we'll use the ones that come with it. I don't think they're very good, but we'll use them, see how they go. Uh, it'll be interesting to compare how this compares with the Crossfire on pretty much the same frequency and at the same power levels. I have a feeling, uh, and we'll see if I'm right, that the Crossfire is going to walk all over this thing. It's going to stomp it to death because of these antennas and, the, and some of the other things I've mentioned. So. We'll see what happens. Um, it's going to be an interesting test. If you'd like to see some other bits and pieces um, about this module, let me know exactly what you want to know and I'll tell you. Um, now, as I say, I've got the other long range systems sitting here. The reason I haven't completed those reviews is this very, very problem. How the hell do you test something that's illegal to use to its limits? It's crazy. I mean, I don't know. But the road test one, the road trip one, is going to be the only solution I can come up with, I think, that's going to be relatively accurate. So we'll do that. So you will see the rest of those long range system reviews and probably most importantly to most people is we're going to be comparing that with this and that. And that'll give us, these are the two top 900 megahertz systems on the market at the moment. Um, price wise I guess it depends where you live but I think they're not too different in price. We'll just see which one is going to deliver on the goods and I'll do a full you know, side by side. And then we'll do the UHF ones as well. And then we'll talk about whether UHF is going to be better than 900 megahertz or what are the pros and cons of each, because there are pros and cons to each. Uh, one of the things is the reason we use UHF for, for long range and not high frequencies is that the lower the frequency, the less the path loss. Now that's the, the rate at which the environment soaks up the signal. So a lower frequency will travel further for a given amount of power, which means in theory you'd think the 433 megahertz ones would go further than the 900 megahertz ones, which in turn go further than the 2.4 gigahertz ones. But there's other benefits to each technology that I'll discuss. So hopefully at the end of it, you'll know which system to choose if you were ever going to fly beyond visual line of sight, which of course you're not going to because it's illegal, isn't it? Okay, thanks for watching. I better get on with the rest of this test. Spot you later.